start. Well. Hello, everybody. I'm so glad to be here with you, and I want to thank everyone from 29C3 for inviting me. Can you hear me okay? Yes? Okay, good. Um, I am a whistleblower, and I know that doesn't translate easily to a lot of languages, but whistleblowing which entails government employees and private sector employees exposing fraud, waste, abuse, and illegality. Whistleblowing has changed drastically in the digital age. By and far, I think computer technology has helped whistleblowers. It helped me back in 2001 I'm one of those cases Jake referred to this morning. I am a whistleblower. I didn't go to work saying, gee, I want to become a whistleblower today. Um, I was actually the ethics attorney for the Justice Department, which is the nation's highest law enforcement agency um, in the United States. And on December 7th of 2001, this is a couple months after 9-11, I received a phone call from another attorney in the criminal division. And he wanted to know about the ethical propriety of interrogating the American Taliban without his lawyer. Do you remember the, what, what I mean by the American Taliban? No, every, you were all babies. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. I'm, it's a reflection on my age. But basically, um, uh, basically, John Walker Lind uh, had gone on a vision quest and found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time, hanging out with the wrong people. Of course, back when he went to Pakistan, he, the America, America was friends with the Taliban, we gave the Taliban money, and even now, after 9-11, they became enemies, but now we're sort of frenemies again um, with the Taliban. So anyway, John Walker Lind became the first capture in the war on terrorism. He also became the first prisoner in the war on Afghanistan. And he was also the first person tortured by the United States in the war on terrorism. So I had received a call about whether or not the FBI on the ground in Pakistan could question him without his lawyer. In the United States, you can't do that. You have to make people aware of what their rights are. Accordingly, being the ethics attorney for the department, I advised that they had to allow him his attorney. That was on a Friday. Over the weekend, the FBI interrogated him anyway. In addition to that, there were photos circulating um, around the world of John Walker Lind, and it looked a lot like he was being tortured. So they come back on Monday, the criminal division attorney says, uh, yeah, we basically blew off your advice and questioned him anyway. What do we do now? And I said, not to worry. There are ways we can take care of this. And basically, we can seal off that interview and use it only for national security and intelligence gathering. Just don't use it for criminal prosecution. That was how we dealt with it. Sometimes people make ethical mistakes and you can still clean up from that. So that was my advice. And then I strangely didn't hear anything for a couple of weeks. And then in January, Attorney General Ashcroft, meaning the highest lawyer in the country who ran the Justice Department, announced that a criminal complaint was being filed against John Walker Lind. And he said, the subject here is entitled to choose his own lawyer. And to our knowledge, he has not chosen a lawyer at this time. I knew that was a complete lie. 
Three weeks later, Ashcroft announced the formal indictment of John Walker Lind and said his rights have been carefully, scrupulously guarded. I don't know if that looks like someone whose rights have been carefully, scrupulously guarded. John Walker Lind was our first glimpse of torture in the United States, and nobody flinched. He was naked, blindfolded, gagged, duct taped to a board. He had a bullet in his leg, no medical treatment. He was found nearly dead. And this is how we treated an American, which can give you a little insight into how we treat people who have the misfortune of being Arab or Muslim in our country. Because if this can happen to John Walker Lind, who's a white guy, from Marin County, California, then you can only imagine the fate of other people who are Arab or immigrant or poor or don't speak English or happen to be the wrong religion. Anyway, Ashcroft and the Department of Justice continued to lie about the conditions of John Walker Lynn's interrogation, how he was found. And meanwhile, as we see with Julian Assange, Top people in Congress and the President pronounced him guilty before ever being tried or ever even being charged. I kept my mouth shut in those beginning weeks. While I knew the Attorney General was lying, I, it was a prerogative of the leader of the department to say what he wanted. But in terms of how I decided to blow the whistle, there was a pivotal event. As a criminal case continued to proceed, I inadvertently learned that the judge, the judge in the case, had ordered all Justice Department correspondence related to the interrogation of John Walker Lind. Such orders routinely go to everybody in the Justice Department. There are 10,000 people in the Department of Justice. I worked directly on the case, and the order was concealed from me. But there was more. I learned about it only because the prosecutor contacted me directly. And I found out there's this order. And then the prosecutor says, I have two of your emails. I wanted to make sure that I had everything. I knew there was a problem. I had no idea about this court order, and I knew I had written way more than two emails. I went and checked the hard copy file. Back then, we used to print everything on paper and store it, primarily not electronically, but in hard copy. Um, I went to check the file. And my email containing the assessment that the FBI had committed an ethics violation in its interrogation of John Walker Lind, and parenthetically, in the torture of John Walker Lind, those emails were missing. My heart sank. I literally felt sick. Someone, they were seeking death penalty for this person and the relevant evidence had not made it to the court, evidence that would have bearing on whether or not his confession would be admissible against him, a confession that was tortured out of him. With the help of computer experts like you, we had just gotten the internet at the department, so this is back in the dark ages um, of computer help at the, at the US government. But with the help of computer experts like you, I was able to recover the missing emails from my computer archives. So that was another important lesson that General Petraeus Petre should have learned, that email doesn't disappear even if you delete it. <laughs> it's still there. Um, you can delete it, you can trash it, you can empty your trash, but it's still there. Um, I, I'm sure you guys are sophisticated enough to know how to actually get rid of it, but surely the people at the department were not. 
um, not that schooled in their, doc in their um, evidence destruction techniques. So anyway, I was able to recover all these missing emails. It said some pretty damning things. I documented the emails in a boss to my memo, in a memo to my boss, excuse me, and I made copies of the emails to take home with me in case they disappeared, disappeared again, which I was worried about. And then I resigned. Months later, the department continued to claim that it never believed at the time of his interrogation that John Walker Lind had a lawyer. I was no longer working there, but I knew the truth and I couldn't live with myself. I couldn't live with the idea that someone's life might be taken because I sat on evidence that I knew I had created. I gave the emails to Newsweek magazine in accordance with a law we have called the Whistleblower Protection Act, which I later found doesn't protect you at all. The Lind case promptly fell apart. He ended up pleading guilty to two very minor charges. Unfortunately, he got a stiff 20-year sentence, so he is in, still in jail. I think he's done with the first tw 10 years, but he'll get out when he's about my age now, um, and at least he'll have a life in front of him. But still, it's a very heavy-handed sentence for someone who didn't really do anything and never raised arms against the United States. After the case was over, I thought my nightmare was ended. I thought, thank God, it's over with. But little did I know in blowing the whistle, in making those emails public, those emails that had been destroyed public, that I unleashed the full force of the entire executive branch of the United States government. As a result of what I did, I was forced out of my new job at a private law firm at the government's urging. I was fired from another job, again, at the government telling my employer that I was a criminal. I was placed under criminal investigation, though I was never told what for, and no charges were ever brought against me. I was referred to the state bar, which in the United States licenses attorneys. I was referred based on a secret report that I didn't have access to making it very hard, if not impossible, to fight the secret charges. If it sounds like something out of a Kafka novel, you're right. The icing on the cake was being put on the no-fly list. It's a terrorist watch list that prohibits you from boarding a plane without undergoing secondary security screening. So I missed a lot of flights um, because of that, and it was also humiliating to have to undergo full screen body searches every single time I flew. I had also recently had a baby, so the icing on the cake was being asked to drink my own breast milk. After years of professional exile, I called them euphemistically my time in the wilderness. But after going through this, I decided to dedicate my life to representing our whistleblowers. As horrible, thank you. As horrible as my ordeal was, it taught me important lessons that I've been able to bring to bear in helping other people who have bravely blown the whistle. People like Tom Drake, who were facing something far worse than I ever could have imagined. 
Like me, Tom Drake was a target of a federal criminal leak investigation. To make matters worse, he was charged under the Espionage Act. The Espionage Act is a little-known World War I law meant to go after spies, not whistleblowers. His case was the beginning of a very disturbing trend in the United States, trying to turn whistleblowers and truth-tellers into criminals. The Obama administration, and I campaigned for, I contributed to, and I voted for Obama before anyone accuses me of being anti-Obama, but the Obama administration has brought more prosecutions against whistleblowers than any previous president, and then all previous presidents of the United States combined. You know who else is being criminally investigated under the Espionage Act? Anyone? <laughs> under seal. Julian Assange is being investigated under the Espionage Act. And then I heard someone say the other name, Bradley Manning, who is actually being prosecuted under the military version of the Espionage Act. I just attended Bradley Manning's torture hearing in the United States. And based on that alone and what was done to him, the case should be dismissed, though I doubt that it will be. I feel that overall, technology ends up helping whistleblowers. I mean, it certainly helped me get the emails that were the proof that the department, which was prosecuting Enron for destruction of evidence and obstruction of justice, the emails proved that they were doing the exact same thing on their own. They were committing criminal acts. Tom, who we'll talk to you in a minute, was exonerated in large part because of what his computer files did and did not show. It turned out that contrary to the government's assertions, he never possessed classified information. He actually had unclassified information that the government later stamped classified improperly. Now sometimes technology, as Jake talked about this morning, you can use it for good or you can use it for bad. The technology that our government has abused includes, for example, using it to retaliate against whistleblowers. Some scientists in the Food and Drug Administration, recently the government used um, spyware and other invasive surveillance techniques against the scientists who were blowing the whistle, and it surveyed the scientists, it surveyed reporters, and it even surveyed members of Congress in order to target seven whistleblower scientists. That obviously, well obviously to me and to you, is an unethical abuse of technology. But by and large, computers and technology have changed the face of whistleblowing for good. Exhibit number one is WikiLeaks. On my way here, I met with Julian Assange. He solidified my belief as a whistleblower myself and as a lawyer for whistleblowers that WikiLeaks is one of the only safe ways in the world to get large amounts of information out to the public anonymously on a mass scale. The government realizes this and is therefore very threatened by WikiLeaks. Instead of launching a worldwide manhunt for Osama bin Laden, they launched a worldwide manhunt for Julian Assange, a blogger, someone who has a website. They tried to shut down WikiLeaks by choking off funding, an effort that's recently been thwarted by a number of creative people coming up with Freedom of the Press. You can go to Freedom of the Press, freedomofpress.org, and contribute anonymously to WikiLeaks and a number of other open government channels. 
and they've tried to force Julian Assange to remain in the Ecuadorian embassy, even though he's been granted asylum. Now, I'm not gonna get into asylum law, but as a human rights attorney, I can tell you that the granting of asylum is because you have a valid fear of political persecution and the government to which you may turn over is unable or unwilling to stop it. That's the international standard. Assange meets that standard. We don't need to jettison ethics, human rights, and the rule of law to achieve security. The notion that we have to make a choice between civil liberties and national security is a false dichotomy that has driven much of the war on terrorism. The war on terrorism should not be a war on ethics, integrity, technology, and the rule of law. Stopping terrorism should not include, thank you. Stopping terrorism should not include terrorizing whistleblowers and truth tellers who raise concern when the government cuts corners to electronically surveil, torture, and assassinate its own people. And it is not okay for a president to grant himself the power to play prosecutor, judge, jury, and executioner of anyone on the entire fucking planet. <laughs> the war on whistleblowers is a toxic trend and I hope our stories will help deprive it of oxygen. In responding to terrorism, we must not trample on the very freedoms for which we are supposedly fighting. I offer my thanks to all of you, my computer chaos compatriots, and to all the bloggers and hacktivists who prove every day that going digital is one of the weapons against despotism who know that there is a difference between privacy and patriotism, and who know that technology prevents tyranny. It is my honor and privilege to introduce my clients, Thomas Drake and Bill Binney, who are the best evidence that employees should never have to choose their conscience over their careers, and especially their very freedom. Thank you. Guten Abend. Ich spreche wenig Deutsch. I have a number of things to share with you this evening, and it's going to be quite sobering as I relate the story of what happened to me as I was placed in the hands of the surveillance state. But it's important for you to know right up front, I will say this in German. Ich möchte nicht in einem Land wie DDR leben. Let me take you back a few years. <laughs> My first computer. It's where I learned to program. I was introduced to the fascinating world during what I call the golden era of computing, the 8-bit age. 6502C processor, had all of 48K of RAM and a 10K operating system. I still have this computer. <laughs> Initially enough, 
This computer was purchased by me when I was stationed in England at RAF Mildenhall, flying on RC-135s during the Cold War. And it was during the time that I was in England, I was a member of a computer club, I ran the Atari section, that I was also introduced to the earlier phases of the Chaos Computer Club and demo parties, things being passed around by sneaker net and through BBSs, acoustic modems waiting for that special signal so you could connect, 300 baud no less. I also did a lot in this space. Now this is the inside of the Atari 800. There used to be a day I could actually modify these boards, put a electrically erasable prom inside the 810 five and a quarter inch floppy disk and give it page six expansion memory. It, wa it was the days and in some ways it was quite innocent. However, what was my day job? or sometimes my night job. It was this airplane. Incredible technology for its day. Phenomenal. It was during this period that I was an air crew member. I was a crypto-linguist. The country I specialized in was East Germany. I never imagined, ever imagined, that I'd find myself some 30, not even 30 years later, 26 years to be exact, find myself seeing the rise of the surveillance state on an extraordinarily vast scale within the United States of America. I also flew on this plane, and so when I served on these aircraft, we did monitor the electronic communications from Warsaw Pact countries, including the Soviet Union. We flew many different routes. And what I became aware of was the extraordinary secrecy and surveillance that was employed in East Germany by the Stasi secret police. And they become monstrously efficient they knew almost everything about the population. To know everything was their motto. I repeat, to know everything. Everything was suspect. And today in the post-Cold War era, I do find myself asking myself and others, how can an open and vibrant democracy exists next to a secret security state. Something has to give. As I found after 9-11, what gave were their precious freedoms and liberties. They're granted to the people, but given up for the sake of security. Secrecy is for losers. This is a quote from Daniel Moynihan former senator passed away some years ago. Note the quote, the compulsory withholding of information, this is what defines secrecy, reinforced by the prospect of sanctions for disclosure. One could call it pre-crime profiling, but again, the basis, the foundation for the state needing to know everything. I have heard this especially since my case, investigation, the prosecution, indictment, and facing 35 years in prison went so public. I've done nothing wrong, I have nothing to hide. In a secret surveillance state, you don't get to define what's wrong or hidden. It's the government that does, in secret. But this is classic Orwellian doublespeak, because in the land of the shadows, a land that I operated in for a number of years. Only the mirage of a mirror is sometimes a prop, or maybe even an agit prop.
the configuration of this flag has a particular meaning for those in the United States. And there's no doubt some of you in the audience who understand when you see the flag of the United States flying upside down, what does that mean? It means you're in distress. The United States is under distress because what's giving is its constitutional form of government. So what happens when you trade liberty for security? As if that's the choice. As Jesslyn said, it's a false dichotomy. Seventeen eighty seven, when that grand experiment was launched, went out to the states, the original thirteen colonies for ratification. A woman reportedly asked Benjamin Franklin, what did you guys do in there? What did you create? And he purportedly said, a republic, if you can keep it. So in the infamous words of Benjamin Franklin, a democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what to have for lunch. And liberty is a well-armed lamb contesting the vote. So what expired on 9-11? A lot of questions were raised, particularly with concern, the concerns of the government's response. But notice what he also says in the next quote, those who give it up, give up essential liberty, to purchase a little temporary safety, deserve neither liberty nor safety. And in the context of this Congress, is data free or the precursor for taking away freedom? It does work both ways. So in a surveillance state, everybody is suspicious. I repeat, in a surveillance state, everybody is suspicious. There is no assumption of innocence. There's actually an assumption that it may be up to no good. And if you're employing techniques involving privacy on internet, that's a red flag. And yet, another quote, from a judge, Damon Keith, democracies die behind closed doors. This is in a ruling he declared back in August of 2002 when the Bush administration acted unlawfully in holding deportation hearings in secret. He further went on to say the following, when government begins closing doors, it selectively controls information rightfully belonging to the people. Selective information is misinformation. But as I found out in my case, it didn't matter what the truth was to the government. They're going to make up what was the truth for their own ends. And so I became a traitor in the eyes of the United States government. And I was charged under the Espionage Act. I stand before you tonight as a free man. But from two th But I can't even begin to tell you, given the egregious ordeal that I went through for the past number of years, what freedom really means. When you're facing the prospect, as I did early on, before I was officially indicted, when the chief prosecutor at the time, in 2008, said, Mr. Drake, how would you like to spend the rest of your natural life in prison? Maybe you better start cooperating. Being charged with the Espionage Act is one of the most egregious things you can be charged with as an American. So what are we looking at? A dystopian future? I'm a canary in the coal mine, as I am with Jesslyn and Bill Binney and other colleagues and any number of others who you will not see in the news. They wanted to put me in prison for telling the truth as a whistleblower. But what was I telling the truth on? 
Yes, I was telling truth to power, but I was exposing government wrongdoing and illegalities. And the government then decided to find out everything they could find out about me and turn me into an enemy of the state. So you blow the whistle on secret power, you expose high crimes and misdemeanors as defined under the Constitution of the United States of America, that's now defined as a criminal act. And yet, it was a truth that kept me free. And one of those people that kept me free gave me the voice I did not have, defended me in the court of public opinion, was Jesslyn Raddick. Let me go back a little bit, and you're going to get what I call the internet version of my story. Internet time is four times regular time, because I see a 15-minute warning in front of me. But this is on purpose, because I want you to get a sense of what it's like to live under the thumb and boot of the surveillance state. What did 9-11 open up? Subversion of the Constitution. Privacy and all data became fair game. Truth was the first casualty in the undeclared war. Propaganda became the pretense of the powerful. And one of my favorite quotes from George Orwell, truth is treason in the empire of lies. So here's the dark side of truth. I was data framed. Remember this character? Recognize this place? No such agency, never say anything. No secrets anymore, except the ones we keep. So, dark side of personal data. Imagine for the moment, my first day in the job is 9-11. I'm reporting to the number three person at the National Security Agency in charge of the single largest element of NSA called the Signals Intelligence Directorate. Little did I know, little did I know what 9-11 would unleash. And so, in a few short days after 9-11, I had people coming to me in private, extremely concerned, saying, Tom, why are they taking equipment that we normally use to monitor foreign nations and we're now redirecting against our own people, replacing on internal domestic networks? I thought there were rules against that. I thought the first commandment, the prime director of NSA, particularly out of all of the problems and the surveillance and the violation of the law during the 50s, 60s, and 70s coming to Ohio in the Nixon administration, we had rules against that. We're not supposed to violate those rules. We're not supposed to spy on Americans. Well. It became clear, because of an effort that I was involved with, that I can't go into detail here. There are some secrets I still need to keep. However, because I was taken off that effort, which was a lawful effort involving current law, involving surveillance in the United States of America and elsewhere against U.S. persons, alarm bells began to rise in my mind. As I found out from others, clearly something was happening. And then I had a very interesting conversation with one of the lead attorneys at the National Security Agency. When I pressed him hard, because I recognized at that point in time, the very first week in October, that NSA was an abject violation of the Constitution and was violating the Fourth Amendment, the, the amendment that guarantees the right to privacy, the right to be left alone. And if the government wants to violate that, they have to go to the court with an affidavit of probable cause, and then they have to get the judge to accept it, and the judge has to sign a warrant and that warrant has to be served on you. They were just bypassing that entire mechanism. And he told me in that conversation that NSA was the executive agent for the secret surveillance program approved by the White House. 
And as soon as he said approved by the White House, I remember what Richard Nixon said. If the president says it's okay, it's legal. And that's precisely what had happened. And so, the next few months, as I discovered even more about this program, I ended up becoming a whistleblower and a material witness for two congressional 9-11 investigations in which I reported everything I knew in early 2002 about this secret surveillance program and massive fraud, waste, and abuse and illegalities conducted by NSA. Of course, as a quick side note, after Bill Binney and his colleagues seeing the subversion of our own constitution retired in October 2001, I became the executive program for an incredible, innovative legal program called Thin Thread. And we discovered when we actually used it to go against the largest database, NSA, that there was things in that database that could have stopped 9-11. But they didn't share it, didn't know it, hadn't discovered it. Of course, that effort got shut down, too. Then Congress, in early 2002, passed legislation that was signed by, the, by President Bush directing NSA to deploy thin thread to the most critical intelligence sites that NSA had, and they defied congressional orders. That all took place within the first few months after 2001. Accelerate forward. December 2005. First public inkling. Blockbuster article written in the New York Times. Eric Lichtblau, James Risen, revealing for the first time publicly the existence of the so-called warrantless wiretapping program and what the government labeled as a terrorist surveillance program. It's fair to say that all hell broke loose within the government. And two weeks later, they launched a massive criminal leak investigation. In the summer of 2006, Bill Binney, as well as other colleagues of mine, were raided by the FBI. Four months later, as I was getting ready to go to work, I'm looking out my bedroom window. A dozen FBI agents streaming across the front yard. There's a very loud knock on the door, and my heart is in my throat. The nightmare had begun. For two and a half years, the government did everything they could to get me to plead out, put extraordinary pressure on me, family, colleagues, and associates. Took two and a half years before they actually decided to indict me. Ten felony counts, five on the Espionage Act, one for obstruction of justice, four for making false statements, which in themselves were false statements. But there is a bottom line. Yes, I stand here as a free man. So obviously I didn't end up in prison. I paid no fine. But the cost was extraordinarily high. But the cost to the United States was even higher. Sold out national security to big business. Violated the Constitution. The very best of American ingenuity and the Constitution were quite sufficient to protect and defend the country with the best we had under the law. There was no, I repeat, no need to go to the dark side, as former Vice President Cheney said, five days after 9-11. So let me leave you with some thoughts. Data absent context is data with no meaning. I can't even begin to tell you how much they took data that they found at my house and on my computers and in my accounts out of context. Ironically enough, the vast bulk of what they found was unclassified information that was used to support the 9-11 congressional investigations and a subsequent Department of Defense Inspector General audit investigation at NSA. Hmm. Lose context, make up the meaning. It's incredibly seductive to manage and manipulate data and for other ends. So what do you do with your data? 
How do you frame your data? More challenges regarding information sharing. Knowledge is control for some, particularly in the surveillance state. You can control the data, in controlling the data, you avoid potential competition and loss of power. What I know data that you don't know data. Coin of the realm. After 9-11, as I confronted my own senior executives in the leadership of NSA, they said, Tom, you don't understand. We live in exigent conditions that requires exigent means to deal with the threat. So be it if we collect all the data on Americans. Hey, if you've done nothing wrong, it won't matter. Really. So there's a the dark side. There is the multi-billion dollar military industrial complex. I cannot begin to tell you the number of multi-millionaires and millionaires that were made at NSA as a result of 9-11. In fact, one senior executive said that 9-11 was a gift to NSA. Either way, same result. Either way. Critical breakdown in IT and security, incalculable loss of intelligence, and the great historical tragedy what could have been. But remember, the history of liberty is also the history of government power. So what about the future of internet? What about losing privacy? Privacy is who we are as people. It's who we are with and for each other. And yet we have this rise of the national security state. You ever wonder, as I mentioned earlier, Section 215 of the Patriot Act? How about Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act, basically given the NSA and the government a back door to all information on U.S. persons under a general warrant, which is actually forbidden, by the way, in our Constitution. You never have general warrants. Writs of assistance, anybody knows U.S. history, that was the thing why we revolted against the king. So we need to free the future one bit at a time. What global commons do we want to keep? What do we do? Consider this, the power to collect and analyze data, especially on people, is seductively powerful, especially when done without the person's permission and particularly when done in secret. It is the ultimate form of control. But here's the real problem, centralized government in this space no matter what its policies. So what internet do you want to keep? What technology can we use to ensure our privacy? Given my own experience and others, George Orwell's 1984 is quite real and now already screaming irrelevant, particularly in the virtual space. Remember, it's only the government can create a police state. It's technology that makes that happen, that enables it. As I did for many years, how many want to live inside a virtual public prison surrounded by a digital fence that's controlled by the government? It's one of the vulnerabilities of internet. I've had significant, detailed, deep te technical conversations with people in this space about the vulnerability of internet. So points to ponder. With the cloud and all the other data out there, the more the data, the more it enables the Leviathan state when placed in the wrong hands. So what tale do you want to tell to future generations? Remember this, with the surveillance state, there is no compromise with respect to the political imperative of controlling the internet. Protection of personal privacy and anonymity masking becomes a red flag threat. Personal online security through obscurity. We need to enable getting lost in the data. We need more Taurus.
We need more Asher Wolfs in the world. Moving spirit guide and agitator behind the crypto party phenomena for the rest of the people. <laughs> Personal privacy and communications deserve anonymized encryption. We need VPN. We need non-logging servers. That's crucial. Anonymized proxies. And we need more people using privacy-protecting packages that are easier to use. There's the challenge. It's been a very difficult six years for me. And I just want to tell you that they've been the most challenging in my life. But I refuse to remain silent in the face of a surveillance state that did everything it could to shut me up. <laughs> Auf Deutsch, was befürchte ich für die Zukunft? What do I fear for the future? Besides fearing for the future of the United States as Constitutional Republic, I do fear the creation of a universal wiretap record of a person's life. The ability to have vast access to databases and on the fly be able to profile anybody at any time, anywhere. George Orwell's 1984, the permanent saving and retention of all electronic transactions through a secret, overarching, all-knowing surveillance regime. Surveillance of citizens through GPS positioning and tracking. The fact that every single cell phone, with rare exception, is a tracking device. This is the kind of dystopia. It's persistent. It's growing. I refer to it as the panopticon, and it raises the prospect of a truly draconian digital surveillance offense all around us and makes us all virtual captives of the state. And so I leave you with this thought, given where I started. I can only imagine how the Stasi would simply drool if the Deutsche Demokratische Republik had had the technical equipment of the NSA today. Bill Benny. Well, good evening. Uh, I'd like to thank the 29C3 Committee Selecting Committee for selecting me to come here because I always find it a very hospitable reception among hackers. Uh, <laughs> so what I'd like to do, I only have half an hour here, but what I'd like to do is give you an idea of some of the experience that I had with the Department of Justice, a uh, conflict of terms there, but, uh, and also the uh, NSA and uh, the FBI especially. Uh, so uh, and I'd like to go through that and also then get into the technology. Um, I can get into this technology because we had, before we left NSA, we had to go to the uh, intellectual capital lawyers and the property rights lawyers and all the uh, legal people in, in, in NSA and talk to them about uh, conflicts of interest and things like that. We didn't, we didn't want to get involved in a conflict of interest. They said, okay, well, anything that you walk out the door with in your head is your intellectual capital. And yes, you can make a, con a, a commercial product out of any of that knowledge that you have. So, uh, since I was designing a system that's monitoring the world, I decided to uh, do a commercial product. Okay, so I now have a commercial product that they put me out of business for, so. so and they blackballed us for doing any business with anyone, uh, since we're all under this cloud of being, you know, criminals in their minds, anyway. 
Uh, so I have that technology. It's on file, uh, basically, uh, with the Library of Congress. We have a copyright on it, so it's open to anybody. For $45, you can get a copy, or you can go to the people here at, at uh, the conference. They have, I gave them copies. You can get copies from them. So it lays out in architectural framework the entire process of how to automate a, an analysis business process across the entire uh, process, whatever you're looking at, whatever kind of data you're doing, because this applies to everything, stock market exchange, money, money exchange, uh, you know, travel, uh, uh, phone calls, emails, uh, Twitter, uh, cloud, uh, Facebook, uh, whatever. So the point is that this is the kind of uh, this will give you, this whole process will give you an idea of what's really going on and the scale of what's happening. So, but first let me go through some of my experiences. I mean, I was at NSA, I was the um, technical director of the World Geopolitical and Military Analysis and Reporting Group, which meant all the technical aspects of everything in the world was something I was supposed to work on if we had a problem, okay. So I was the kind of guy that we were supposed to go around and create new ways of looking at things and solving problems and generally stir up stuff and change the culture and everything, you know. So become an irritant to everybody because I was changing their ways and change is something that everybody resists, okay. So, um, so as a part of that, uh, in the, in the mid-90s, I also had a, a, a I was the co-founder of a, a SIGIN Automation Research Center. It was a small uh, group of people, about 16 total. And we were working for four or five projects at the time, so, so I had to divide those 16 people among all those projects. So, uh, but we had mixed skills, and that was the beauty of it because we had computer programmers, engineers, and we had access to physicists. We didn't have one normally, but we could get them if we needed and had a physics problem. We had crypt analysts, we had, we had crypto mathematicians, uh, and traffic analysts, uh, systems and data analysts, and language analysis. So we had all the skills together. The other, my other partner that was co-founder was up from the research division. So he brought all the skills that were in the technologies and I brought all the stuff out of operations. So we had them all there and we would all work together at developing how to, how to solve a problem, whatever that problem was. In this case, it was the internet and mass communications that was populating the world in this, starting in the early 90s. So that was our major thrust and our focus. Um, and uh, we actually solved that problem, and of course our commercial product here will show you how that worked. And uh, we did it with three, a little over three million dollars. Now Tom mentioned uh, the pro program Thin Thread that cost us three, a little over three, about three million two hundred thousand to do. Uh, and what we came into conflict with, and the reason it was rejected by the agency and thrown away, was because we were in conflict with a four plus billion dollar program called Trailblazer that would start from scratch and was in, <clears throat> that was going to be spending a lot of money with a lot of contractors, so there was a lot of vested interest to get rid of us, okay? Which is exactly what they did. So uh, they did, got rid of everything except the back part because they didn't have, the back processing that we had was the only process they had that would handle large, massive volumes of data. Okay, so that they used, okay? And in, uh, uh, I was, I was sick of the corruption, so I decided to retire in about June of 2001. So I told the, the deputy director and uh, the SID director that I was going to retire. And it was my intention to get the hell out of there. Uh, I didn't tell them why, because it was all the corruption and stuff that they were involved with the money exchange with contractors, hiring contractors in to manage programs that would send contracts back to the contracting organizations they came from. It was like an incestuous relationship, you know. So. Literally, you know, it was, uh, you know, I need somebody to manage me, so let me hire this executive vice president over of the um, SAIC or something to come in and manage all these transformation programs, billions of dollars worth of programs. And of course, hundreds of millions of program dollars went off to the place where they came from. So, you know, they were earning their money, but not for the people. So I referred to that as a conscious decision of the government of the United States to trade the security of the people of the United States and also of the free world, by the way. This is, you were involved in this because we came across anything, you were protected also. So they traded your security as well as ours for money. That was what they did. And they still don't have the solutions that we were working on 12 years ago. That's why their big data initiative is coming out and you know, they're asking for automated algorithms to figure out what we were working on 12 years ago. But because they destroyed the SARC, right, and our whole process, they threw the whole process away, except for that back end part, 
they made themselves incapable of, of readdressing that same, those same issues. They had to relearn and redo everything, but they didn't have the skill mix to make it work. In other words, they didn't have the people who, were, who would work together to make that happen. So they killed that entire structure to make that work. So as a part of that, when they started taking in uh, the telecommunications data, which the telecoms eventually had to get uh, retroactive immunity from George W. I referred to George W. as the replacement for George III, you know, which was uh, King of England when we when it had a revolution. So we got rid of him and ended up with George the W. So, uh, <laughs> so that meant uh, they were taking in all the data about everybody that the telecommunications uh, had record of. In other words, the billing data. That was how you could build communities and, and uh, re reconstruct all of the people you were working with, your social network and everything, and how you were reacting or acting with this community that you had. So that was the whole objective of that, that, that particular process. So when I found out about that, I said, gee, you know, I, I was at one time considering sticking around to try to help solve the terrorist problem. Uh, because the sites that were picked to originally deploy and, and or ordered by Congress were the sites I picked, which were the terrorist target sites. I went to the terrorist group and said, give me all the sites that you had, because it was under me, so I, you know, it was the world. So, so I went and I said, give me all the, t all the sites that produce any information that's valuable to you in an analyzing terrorist targets. So they gave me a list. So I said, okay, this is the target list, right? That's, you know, pretty simple. And uh, so I put that up as the list, and it was going to cost nine and a half million dollars to do those sites. Nine and a half million. And they didn't do it. Because if they did, that would declare the problem was solved, and they wouldn't need the, f need the four plus billion that they said they needed to solve the problem that was already solved. So they didn't do that, but I'll get into some of that technology here. So, uh, so after that, when I found out, uh, because the, the contractors they had to use were my contractors, they had to use them to set up the code. They were the only ones that knew the code and how to set it up and make it work. So they had to use them to set it up. So when they did that and started taking data in, they came to me and said, you realize what they're doing? They're doing this, you know? I wasn't supposed to know about the program. It's called Stellar Wind. All right, that was their, that was their program to spy on everybody. So, uh, they came to me and told me that, and I said, well, immediately, I, I, you know, I knew all the people. I knew Alec, I, knew, I know Alexander, I know, I know Hayden, I know Clapper, I know all these, McConnell, I know, McConnell, I know them all, right? So, and I, and I knew it was pointless to do anything inside the agency. It was an absolute lost cause. So I went directly to the House Intelligence Committee, who is, res they are responsible under the FISA laws to, and, oh, and the Intelligence Acts of 47 and 78 to monitor the intelligence community and any spying they were doing on U.S. citizens. <clears throat> that was their prime, that was a fallout of the church committee hearings. So uh, I went there because it was their responsibility to do that monitoring. And I knew the, the uh, chief staff officer who was in charge of the mon monitoring NSA. So I went in and said, hey, here's the program that they're doing all this. I didn't know the name of it at the time, but uh, she went to talk to Hayden, and she talked to Porter Goss, who was the chairman of that committee. And the point was they all bought into it. She also talked to uh, Nancy Pelosi. Well, Nancy was the uh, uh, ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee at the time. And if you looked at uh, Cheney's uh, uh, interview in reviewing the, uh, uh, in the 10th anniversary of 9-11, he talked about how the program was formed, terrorist surveillance. He said they have to thank the guys at NSA, Hayden's guys at NSA. I never got the thank you note, so. But the point was, they are now in violation of all the, of any number of laws, the Electronic Privacy Act, uh, Electronic Security Act, the, the Intelligence Act of 47. They called it a covert program and uh, limited it to knowledge of four people in Congress. That was the, uh, the chairman and ranking members of the House and Senate and Intelligence Committees. Now those people don't monitor anything. There's a staff that does that. Okay, and if they call it a covert program, they could limit knowledge of it. They're supposed to tell the gang of eight, which is the majority and minority leaders, the House and Senate in addition, uh, but they didn't do that. Uh, but that's why Nancy Pelosi said uh, that impeaching George W. Bush is off the table. She was co-opted co into the program as they developed it, and she signed up to it. So, at also the CIA programs. So if, if she was going to authorize the impeachment of George Bush, 
she'd be impeaching herself too, and that was the leverage that George had on her. It's like they were creating a super uh, steroid uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover because they would have leverage on everybody in the country by doing this. So no one was safe, okay. So that's why I went directly to the committee. I just wrote off all NSA management and the entire administration. They were all, they were all culpable in this. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the <clears throat> talk with the, or the attempts to talk to the House Intelligence Committee Goss and, and Pelosi failed. I mean, they were going to do nothing. All they did was say, you need to talk to Hayden. So they sent uh, the staffer out to talk to Hayden, and she, he just basically said, you better keep quiet because it's highly classified. You know, never mind, it's against our Constitution, all the laws we had, right? So, so she came back and said that, so I tried to, uh, I had a sub, uh, we're working on a subcontract for, the, for another agency, not the NSA, <laughs> and uh, the guy we were setting it up with was, uh, went to high school with the daughter of Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Winquist. So it's really his job to oversee all of this violation of the Constitution. I mean, he's the, supposed to be the, the staff holder of that responsibility. So uh, we wrote a note to give to him, to give to Rehnquist's daughter, to pass to Rehnquist so we could get a meeting with the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Because if we went through the regular channels, you know they'd all filter it out. So we tried to set up a backdoor approach to do that so we could inform of all the violations of the Constitution. They scrapped the, the Fourth Amendment, they scrapped the Fifth Amendment, all of that, all of that's used against everybody. So uh, after that, <clears throat> uh, that failed, and I figured that failed because he probably had an inkling of what was going on and wanted deniable, uh, plausible deniability. So if we informed him of that, he couldn't, he couldn't deny that he knew about it. Right? It was just like the House and Senate Intelligence Committees, or the Judiciary Committees, when they were reviewing, uh, uh, re when they were reviewing retroactive immunity for all the telecoms. Uh, the, the reason they were, they, they were claiming they didn't know what was going on. Well, the telecoms only have two things to offer. One is the billing data about their customers, and the other is access to the wires they run, both of which were being violated. Mark Klein you know, laid that out in San Francisco with all the uh, NARIS devices on the fiber optic lines running inside the United States. Uh, so, uh, and I knew uh, that the, the one company I knew that, that was produ producing data was AT&T, and they were providing um, on the order of 320 million records a day of US citizens talking to other US citizens. So you can imagine you can quickly, you can quickly build the communities on virtually everybody in the country. Now, you can imagine this extended to everybody in the world also, because there was no limit on the capabilities that I, we put together. So after that, uh, uh, the, then, see, Gonzales, we, we tried to do uh, work with other committee members and House and Senate members to see if we couldn't influence them that way, but that didn't work. So we ended up going to, uh, to the Department of Justice Inspector General's office. This was after, uh, after Obama came into office. We had hoped that he might do something different, and of course he didn't, okay. We, we took him through the entire Stellar Wind program, what it was doing, and all the, all the participants that we knew about at the time, and how much data was involved, and the violations that it, they, were, they were performing. So we, 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 uh, we failed to impress him to do anything either, okay because they published a joint IG report on surveillance in uh, mid-2009 uh, that basically said, well, you need to monitor it more closely and have more, uh, uh, more observation of the system. But the, so, so, so that did absolutely nothing. So our entire government was failing internally. They wouldn't face their own problem. You know, they were violating, making, violating laws in the Constitution. They wouldn't face up to it and correct their actions. But we were working internally to try to make that happen. It just didn't work at all. So, uh, <clears throat> so then uh, after Gonzalez was testifying in the Judiciary Committee, uh, in the Senate Judiciary Committee about all the surveillance programs in June or July of uh, uh, 2007, and two days after that, they raided everybody. We also complained, by the way, to the DOD IG. Uh, we filed a complaint that got us all into trouble, and that's the reason we got raided, because we said, here's all the corruption, fraud, waste, and abuse at NSA, and that's by regulation what we were supposed to do. They, you know, government policy was to report that, and they gave you the phone numbers to call in, so we did, you know. 
That was a big mistake. Don't tell the government where they're wasting money or where, where there's crimes or fraud. So they sent the FBI to us, and to make a story sh short on the FBI raid, they came uh, pushing through the door. My son opened the door to them. There were like 12 of them, and they came in with their guns drawn, and they pushed him out of the way at gunpoint, came upstairs. I was in the shower. My wife was putting her clothes on. They were, came into the bedroom, was putting, pointing guns at my wife, and they came to the shower and pointed a gun at me and said, I'm, you know, put, drew me out of the shower. So I had been cooperating with these people for three months before that, telling them everything I knew, because you know, I signed an affidavit that I never talked to anybody in, in, in uh, the news. So, so I, I thought they would understand that, that, was, uh, that I didn't do that. But that wasn't the point of the raid. The point was to keep my, me quiet. Well, at the same time, you see, when they were on the back, they tried to get me to implicate somebody in a crime. They said, tell me something that will, that will implicate somebody in a crime. They were actually after Tom Drake and also uh, Diane Rourke, who was the House Intelligence Oversight Committee member that oversaw the NSA account. That was their grudges, so they hold grudges. So when he put it that way, tell me something that would implicate somebody in a crime, I only knew of one crime. So I said, okay, George Bush, Dick Cheney, Tennant and Hayden violated the Constitution, any number of laws, and here's how they did it. The program's called Stellar Wind. They're taking data in on everybody in the country, and they're mapping it out, all our communities, and they're monitoring us. They come in, and millions of records every day. <clears throat> now, now, I should say, there was only one agent on the back porch, when I was doing this on the back porch, there was only one agent that was cleared for that program. He was the guy who signed the warrant, okay? And all he could do when I was saying all this and explaining this program, the violations of all the rights and laws and stuff, was look at the floor. He couldn't look up because he knew he was participating in, in covering up all the crimes they were committing. He was trying to keep me quiet. They put the guns on us, because, and my family too, because they wanted us to stay quiet. Well, you know, that was a red flag to me. I mean, that was the first thing. And then they started fabricating uh, charges against us. And I, every time I found exculpatory data that they had, but I also had, so I was backed up, you know. So they took my computer and everything, but they didn't get any data. I mean, I, all, I also had all that. But so I had that. So I called Tom, and this, this is the funny part, because I knew Tom's phone was tapped. I didn't know about mine. I wasn't sure about that, but I knew his was. So I called Tom, and I said, Tom, you know, uh, this latest indictment, that our lawyers told them they were going to indict us, so the latest indictment they had was, was going to address us in a conspiracy, and here's the data they had that they were going to charge us with a conspiracy. So I went down the line of all the exculpatory data I had, and I said, Tom, this is evidence of malicious prosecution. Tell your lawyer about this so you can bring it up in court. Well, we never heard about it again. Okay, that was the end of that. That charge went away. So. <clears throat> But I mean, it shows you the shallow, fake character of these people when they're framing people. Like the material they framed, they were trying to frame Tom with was marked unclassified. Well, they drew a pencil line through the unclassified and stamped it top secret and said, they charged him, when they're in a review, they charged him with having un unclassified material that they reclassified so they could charge him with having classified material. Well, uh, Jim Bamford did a FOIA on that to NSA, and you know they don't know what they're doing at the FOIA office because it's such a big place, left hand doesn't know what the right does. So they gave him some copies of the stuff. He asked for it, and they gave it to him unclassified. So he took it into Judge Bennett and said, you know, hey, look at this. They're charging with these as classified, and they're giving it to me in a FOIA request, unclassified. So he said, as a as a, as a friend of the court, he gave it to Judge Bennett, and then Judge Bennett said, gee, this really says they're fabricating everything, so they're, they're actually, a, that was a felony. They're framing him. That's a felony. They should have been charged with a felony, at any rate. So that really, that was the icing on the take. Then I said, I have to go public with all this, and I, and I need to have my name on it so that I'm not hiding. I'm no, I'm no you know, secret informer. I'm out there saying, because I'm, Nobody's challenging me, by the way, because I know too much, okay? At any rate, uh, I need to get into technology. I have a short period of time here left, so let me do that so you have, a, so you have an idea what the technology is all about. Uh, what this is, this was a design we had for input from, a, um, from any source, like take several hundred or several thousand NARIS device, NARIS Insight devices where you have 10 gigabit sessionizers and processors with deep packet management running. So you have to take that as an input 
in the front end, and you have to validate the data. This is most important also with CRIP system. You have to validate the CRIP system and actually map through the device. You have to map and equal the device. You have to get all the continu continuity of that device. So then you can attack that CRIP system. It's, and you have to do the same thing with data. It's the same thing for, with data. So when you do validation, then you do uh, event recognition, you're going through looking for reliable events to allow you to assess what's going on in that data. Okay? And once you do that, then you want to put privacy protections in. This can be for everybody or anybody in the world. It, didn't, it wasn't restricted to U.S. citizens. You could in, you could in, we had a, a, an encryption process that uh, scrambled all the data so it wasn't in the proper position. You have to ensure that so they couldn't force crib it. You get a false result. So, <laughs> but that's, uh, that, was, uh, that was built into that. We also had distributed storage and also indexed the content to, that, to all these transactions going on. And then you build the activity graph. This is where you put the relationships together and build the, uh, build the social networks. And you also, at the same time, if you have content, you keep it mapped to that, uh, to that graph and to the nodes in the graph. And then you take in other domains other from other, either other agencies or other kinds of information, input that into a central graph where you're really building the large profile of everybody in the world, okay? So, and how you do that is now you get into the, the graph. This was the way we wanted to select data. And we proposed this for $250,000, we would do this for the NSA. We made this proposal to NSA. It's an unclassified proposal. We wanted, we wanted to go through all of the collection and look at all the targets that you had known targets and then look out two degrees as possibly associated with that activity and look at uh, latent semantic indexing of the data that's in common, two degrees out within any data they're passing here to see if it's reliably matching and therefore you, 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 you then would start to say, well, this guy might be a new target and we need to look closely at him and then and just make that decision at that point. But what the point of this two degree thing was, was to manage the volume of data, right? The other seven billion people are out here. We were throwing all that data away, okay? That was not, cap that was not collected, stored anywhere. Okay, so that was just thrown away. And that was how we would protect everybody in the world. We would not have your data. Well, see, the NSA knew what I was all about, and they knew that was my perspective, so they didn't accept our $250,000 proposal. I mean, so they're now trying to do big data initiative for $250 million in the DOD every year and, you know, a few hundred million in other agencies. Any rate, so that's the idea, and that's how we would select the data. And because you'd have to have relationships that made you close to something. We also had other algorithms we could look at in terms of the networking to see if there might be some suspicious network or community out there in the, in the other network, but we didn't share that with NSA. So, because that's another thing they want, they want to be able to do that. Okay, that's all the automated algorithms they want running. So, uh, uh, but we didn't, we didn't do that, and all it would do was raise suspicion, meaning you had to look closer at it not make them a target immediately. But they were talking about doing that with metadata, which meant they were talking about using this kind of material to use targeting to kill people. I mean, that's insane. Anyway, all that data is indexed to the graph, and th this is basically the timeline. You take all the attributes that you're mapping in the community, pull them out, and all the index data that comes with it. So now you can build a timeline, over time, this is the research we did on 9-11, all the terrorists and their activity during nine, uh, just before and up to 9-11, right here, September 2001. But this is the idea. You want these timelines and then you want to look at the interactions in the community to see what kind of interaction profiles could you use to inference the intents and capabilities of these, of these people. But this is done by the code on everybody input to the system. It's not done by people, it's done by the code. So, and also they want algorithms to go through these timelining process, through the timeline process on all the communities to, to figure out profile, what we call profiles of interest of, of, of communities of interest and, and new profiles from other uh, communities. So the idea was to do this, uh, this was done so that people could look at it actually for the automated process. We wouldn't, we simply take it in list form and do the processing that way. I mean, you know, we didn't have to see a, a picture of it, but this was done for people. 
Um, that's how you commercially sell things, right? <laughs> Uh, but uh, we, of course, were uh, raided and stopped, and so we, we, aren't, we aren't marketing this at all. Plus, they busted up our coalition to do it, so. And they made it impossible for us to get any, anything, any work anywhere, so. That's what our government has done to us. And what, in fact, they are able to do with everybody in the world. That's the real problem. Because this kind of knowledge centralized in what I call the central government run by the central committee, true Soviet terms, okay? That's very dangerous because they can, they, you know, they can, they, initially after 9-11, they made so many mistakes in the graph and tipping off things to the FBI. They said they got thousands of false tips. That's because they don't know what they're doing. Well, incompetence on this scale is exceedingly dangerous. It is. And um, I'm not sure that uh, with the people in place right now that, I mean, I really think they should all be put, taken into court and tried and given their chance to speak in court as to what they did and why. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> so, but that's, uh, that's the technology, and there's a lot more to it. I've got a lot more slides. If you, wanted, if you want copies, they're available here somewhere, and you're, you're welcome to them. And also, I've got all those architectural framework diagrams showing how to automate at least the what to do and dependencies on the flow of that kind of information through an entire enterprise, no matter what the enterprise is. We were going to use it to do Medicare, Medicaid fraud. Uh, you could also use it for the stock market, for, for any, that kind of approach. So. So it's here, and if you uh, are interested, you can, I'm sure they'll be glad to get you copies. Thanks. So thank you, Jesslyn, Thomas, and William. We have two microphones in each aisle. If you have questions, please line up. Questions from the internet? Yeah, number two. Right. Um, so thank you for your wonderful and insightful talk. Um, <laughs> yes, please do. Jake was talking about uh, Shades of Grey and how his view on NSA and uh, security and uh, intelligence activities changed uh, as he heard your stories. And uh, from my perspective, as a young German person involved with the internet, um, it's, uh, it's actually a point of view that is kind of alien to me. And I'm glad to have heard you speak uh, so that I could see your point of view. Um, if, uh, if you consider how uh, the jobs that you were doing, how, um, and as I noticed you were doing faithfully, uh, in being uh, convinced that you were doing good for your country and the people of it. Um, if you consider that goal that you had and always pursued, and how it played out, how uh, the apparatus that you were a part of um, has acted against you under certain circumstances uh, which you brought about or did not bring about, how would you advise young people um, who are approached or who may be thinking of uh, information technology that is fit um, or even targets this kind of activity, uh, as in data mining, as in intelligence, people who might even have uh, the desire to protect in a sort of uh, intelligence gathering uh, activity. Um, do you think you could advise them to, to do engage in intelligence activities or <coughs> would you maybe advise people to steer clear of it right away? No, actually, I would advise infiltrating, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, you, but, you have, but you have to remember, you never lose your integrity and character. What these people do is corrupt integrity and character. And so then anything becomes, what they do is they, they, get, they then have a view that everybody operates this way. And this is the normal way to, to be corrupt, basically. 
is the norm when in fact it should be the extreme and they should be prosecuted. Thank you. Yeah. Number one. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you very much for this talk. Um, very enlightening. Actually, Mr. Binney, um, I have a question for you. Um, I have seen an interview with you before you were elaborating about the new data centers of um, US intelligence. Um, my question, this is the first question I have. Um, how do you assess the real world capabilities of those? What is actually possible? Is every data that is anywhere being intercepted stored? And is it how is the capability of analysis um, compared to the amount of, of data available? Yeah. Second question would be you, um, you were shortly talking about targeting. Um, does this involve um, drone targeting, drone attack targeting, yes. and how? Well, uh, what you have to, uh, well, let me take your first question first. Uh, it had to do with uh, uh, the, the, um, the, w w the first one you were asking was, could you, capabilities. Well, the point is, uh, how many nearest devices can they afford to buy? Literally, they can buy thousands. So that, and you multiply that by 10 gigabits a second, and what's the capacity of the world communications? I mean, to me, I, I uh, set the goal of uh, doing 20 terabytes of data a, a minute. Uh, it was basically my, that was my estimate of the amount of unique data, not, not repeats across different segments of the line, but of unique data passing across the entire network. So that was my estimate, so I set that as the initial goal. Maybe we'd have to go higher. But you need to, the, you had to have a design of, in, of knowledge acquisition in that, and then also delta differencing knowledge and sharing the deltas so you could reduce the problem of, re of updating all of, the, all of the graphs that are, that are deployed necessary to make this process work. So, but by delta differencing, every, every change, is it something new? If it's not something new, you don't, you don't need to up, update your graph. It, that you're using to filter information. But if you get something new that's important to, to, to filter out, to look at, then you, that needs to be distributed across all the graphs around the world so that they then could pick up all of that information and forward it. Okay, so uh, my estimate of that is that's probably what they're already doing. That's why they need Bluffdale. Because Bluffdale, by my estimate, uh, could hold on the order, if you only took uh, uh, textual type data and uh, the audio that you were targeting, your target list, that uh, Bluffdale, which according to my estimates also, <laughs> will hold five zettabytes of data, even with current capability that's advertised and you can buy. This is probably not their, they're probably gonna do better than that, okay. But just with five zettabytes, that's probably on the order of 100 years of worth of collection of the world's communications. That's my estimate, too. But it sure is a lot, okay. <laughs> I mean, five zeta bytes is five times 10 to the 21st bytes. A lot of bytes. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not, it's, not a, it's not a Yoda byte, though. <laughs> that's the next step. And that's what they're working on now, I'm sure. So, so five zeta bytes was my minimum estimate there for that storage alone. That's not the only site. They're building that one because they're collecting too much data and they need more storage. So that's their estimate of need for the future. Okay. They're already, they're already so, storing data, okay. Questions from the internet. Oops. Uh, I was asked to uh, ask you, how was your flight to the Congress? Uh, any special treatment? Uh, no, I got no special interest uh, from my government or, or your government either. They welcomed me here, so I thought that was nice. And the other two? I'm quite certain they have interest, but nothing that I noted that was overt. I found it much easier to exit my own country than to get back into it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, another question? Yep. Um, did you ever thought about uh, emigrating from your country? 
Uh, my wife did, yes. <laughs> she thought we should leave. That was after they were pointing guns at all of us. And, and we'd been cooperating and loyal citizens and trying to use the system and, and the laws that the country had and the Constitution to try to influence the government from doing the illegal, unconstitutional activity they were. And all that failed. And then we went for you know, years trying to do that with the hope that somebody would listen, and nobody did. Because it was all national security. I said, we have to do this, otherwise we won't be able to get the tariffs. And that's absolutely false. We had zero difficulty doing it with this technique. Nothing was, I mean, they couldn't sneeze that we wouldn't know what they were doing. And since we automated the process, we didn't, we didn't depend on people to recognize events and make sure that everybody knew about them. We just automatically did it within 20 to 100 milliseconds. I definitely thought about leaving the country. Two of my brothers are expats in Sweden and Finland. Um, but like Jake said this morning, like I still believe in my heart of hearts that our country is not beyond redemption. Right. I mean, Tom asked very specifically, is this the kind of republic we want to keep? And clearly, it's not. After 9-11, the pendulum swung really far. I should make it swing really far to the right. And I thought, 10 years later, it would sort of go back to the middle, to this point of equipoise. But instead, it has continued yeah. to swing. Well, I'm hoping it will swing back. In my case, <clears throat> I chose to stay and take a stand. I did not want to see the grand experiment that was launched in 1789 disappear before my very eyes. And I, too, have hope. Just because there's a few in the power elite and the, in the halls of government who've chosen willfully and by acts of, of commission subvert the Constitution does not mean that the country's not worth saving from them. Yeah. <clears throat> Question to Thomas Drake. Do you think to keep more freedom in the internet, we need to split data of the internet to certain authority outside of the USA? Authority, uh, authority is an overloaded word. Yeah. And yet in my experience, the authority attempts to replace law and rules that govern the commons I said internet was vulnerable. It's vulnerable because the very strength of internet, its openness and transparency, yeah. is the very thing that threatens authoritarian government. And so they want to own it. And there are very troubling trends, as evidenced by certain international meetings, by evidence of certain agreements that are being conducted in secret, and especially negotiations, as evidence by attempts to control the means by which the data actually transits, particularly at the key nodal points, particularly in terms of the translation points, and domain naming network services. It is troubling. From the legal perspective, for example, an example of what Tom says and an example of having some great authority out there. The government right now, the United States government, is urging all citizens to fight Chinese spyware by giving your data and access to your data to the government because they will protect you. <laughs> Things like that are a transparent attempt to regulate the internet. Not so transparent are national security letters to get people's Twitter information, something with which Jake Applebaum, I'm sure, is all too familiar. Um, right now, the government can secure your internet service provider records with something called a national security letter. 
and the internet service provider not only is under no obligation to tell you, they are prohibited from letting you, the customer, know. So these things are very insidious. I mean, that was courtesy of the Patriot Act. But these moves that, again, are ostensibly done for our protection and to make us safe um, really show the surveillance creep and how it goes into the law and, and transcends the, the actual thing. Right now, as, as we talk to you right now, before the United States Congress, right now is hotly debated the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act amendment that made legal retroactively all the illegal stuff that was done under Bush for eight years. So right now, ironically, that's being debated. The fact that this is up for debate is a problem in and of itself. The fact that torture is up for debate is a problem in and of itself. I mean, these are, are no-brainers. They're wrong. I would like to add that any authority control that's done in secret without the consent of the people or the use of the data that is actually yours, not theirs, is the equivalent of a turnkey totalitarian state and we're not that far from having that type of state virtually. We really aren't. The government in the United States of America already has the ability with its vast access to all kinds of data and increasingly becoming more and more centralized to so profile anybody it wants to at any time. And yet if you dissent against authority control, they will censor you, they will silence you. You have in front of you on this stage three people who stood up and took a stand to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America, took a stand to defend the privacy rights of all Americans. The, 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 the equation's been inverted. What was protected as private, that was sanctified as private, what was stated as leave us alone, encapsulated in that Fourth Amendment, it's now inverted. The government can conduct itself in secret away from the governed. And yet, apparently, they've given themselves a right outside of the Constitution to violate your privacy at will while any question whatsoever. Okay, number two. Uh, good evening. I would first of all thank you for mm. standing up and doing what you thought was right and yeah. congratulate you on being lucky enough to be here tonight. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, <laughs> <laughs> I made it. <laughs> I have a question yeah. um, that I's, I've asked myself many times since 9-11. And um, do you personally think that the people who implement these programs um, do this from a standpoint that they think they do what's right? They um, no. Being like sort of a hell is the road to hell is paved with good intentions thing, no. or is it more of a um, protecting? A, I would like to say grifting operation. Mm -hmm. So protecting, <laughs> controlling people with fear, and thereby being able to having this incestuous relationship you mentioned with. Um, let me just say Halliburton at this point. So could you? Your personal no, opinion uh, on that would interest well, me. Well, I know certain things that uh, would relate to that. Uh, one is that. Uh, George Tenet, when he was director of CIA, said, I have no view inside the United States. And of course, that was, that was Mike Hayden's chance to give him that view. So that was the start of it. Cheney backed it. And the whole thing was called a Cheney blood oath internally in NSA, by the way. That's what it was called. They referred to it that way. So and everybody knew what they were talking about, the ones who knew about the program anyway. but. Uh, they went, uh, Hayden went around uh, early, I think it was Hayden uh, from NSA, went around uh, to all the telecom uh, CEOs and asked them in February of 2001, seven months before 9-11, okay. asked them to provide them all their customer data. That showed intent to do this spying even before 9-11. So the, the, the intent was to, to be able to, 
to monitor what people in the United States or anywhere in the world were doing so that they had a view of everything in the world. That was their objective, in my view. That was what their intent was. I didn't know about that until 2006, but you know that, that showed it from the very beginning, their intent. And 9-11 was simply an excuse to say, hey, let's uh, do a little fear-mongering here and make this happen, which is what they did. And they're doing fear-mongering now with the, with the cybersecurity. It's to get more money and, and do their own thing, build a bigger empire, you know? In fairness, I think a lot of people who are young and graduating from university, they go to work for the government and go in, as I did, very naive, very optimistic. The government wears a white hat. Here's my chance yeah. to change things for the better. I think when Bill started at the NSA, you felt you were doing the right thing and that for most of your career, the agency was doing <laughs> the right thing. I think now, when it's perfectly clear what's being done, people, even those who go in with good intentions, all of them drink the Kool-Aid. Um, a number of my counterparts in the human rights community, including Harold Coe, who's one of the highest up people at the State Department, had been the dean of my law school and one of the biggest anti-torture advocates. Um, quickly goes to the other side for the purpose of having the power. And there are numerous other names that I won't call out, and you can thank me later on for protecting your privacy better than you've protected mine. But um, <laughs> the, the, there, this other category of people who are just blatant sellouts. I mean, yes, you can go in and yeah, drinking the Kool-Aid is a potent um, potion, but yeah, there are a number of people who are blatant sellouts. They want the title, they want the imprimatur of having worked for the United States government in a high level position. And if that means giving the United States authority to assassinate people, to have drone strikes, on innocent civilians, or anybody for that matter, because no one who gets obliterated by a drone has any kind of due process at all. Um, you know, those people are completely selling out. And for the people who are already in the system and have been entrenched in the system for a long time, and who move in and out of the system between the private sector, they yeah. damn well know what they're doing. I, want, I wanted to add one more thing. Uh, I, I was having this discussion with one of the group chiefs at NSA, you know, before I retired. And, uh, we, you know, we both came into NSA in the uh, 1960s. So we said, well, you know, when we came in to work there, the value system was uh, mission was first, people second, organization third, and self was last. And now the value system is exactly the reverse. So that's, that value scheme you know, uh, promotes this kind of corruption. Sounds scary. Yeah. In the summer of 2002, Diane Rourke, who had been the NSA overseer on the House Permit Select Committee on Intelligence, remember we had been doing everything we could within the system to raise more than just passing concerns about the violations of the Constitution, approved by the White House, I might add again. She had an opportunity to speak directly with Lieutenant General Michael V. Hayden, who was the director of NSA at the time, and asked why. Why did you do it? Because we had the power. It's a value system. That's the value system. Okay. Thank you for your honest answers. Okay, we, have, we don't have too much time left, so please stay focused. Number one. Hello. First of all, thank you for your unique and inspiring stories. Uh, I have two questions. The first is related to the last. Um, you, there are a majority of people, I mean the majority of people working in uh, agencies like NSA and FBI, CIA doing the wrong stuff. They obviously continue to do it. Uh, I mean you're a minority, you're like what, 1%, like a quarter of a percent. What made you um, take that flip? What made you uh, jump, jump the wagon? And why do you think there are so many people continuing to do wrong stuff? 
And my second question would be, I'm, I'm from a country with a GDP uh, that's like 1% of USA's. Uh, how do they cooperate? How does the uh, USA cooperate with countries with a re really low GDP but really talented people in, in the black hats or white hat department, if you have any information on that? Well, uh, I, I, as far as the cooperation goes, the, uh, the, uh, there are relationships all around the world, and it varies uh, what degree they have, okay, in terms of the capabilities and sharing at the level of capabilities or sharing capabilities. That's, that's done country by country. So I'm, I'm not, I haven't been back to NSA working there for 12 years now. <laughs> so, you know. I'm not sure what's going on there now, so. But th that's, the way, that's the way they deal with relation, international relationships. So, um, and, and the other one was, I lose track, I'm getting how old, you, you know. Flip. How do you how do from you? being an insider to... Oh, 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 why, yes, why, what, what made me uh, do that? Well, I'm from a small town, okay? I, my, I grew up in a small town. There were like 3,200 people and everybody knew everybody else. And what that meant was, who you were as a person was your character, okay? That, that was you. What you did was a reflection on your character. So I could not participate in all these violations of law and the Constitution because it would be degrading my character to do that. So it was built into me from the beginning as a small town, uh, from, coming from a small town. That's the kind of values you get at that, at that, at that scale and when, you, when you, people know each other and, and look after one another you know, as a community. I think for a lot of us, whether we worked for a government agency for decades, as Bill did, or for me, under, right under 10 years, there was a seismic shift after 9-11. So I don't feel like any of us decided to jump the rails and do something radical. I think our problem was we continue to do our job ethically. Yeah. We got in trouble because the United States decided with the two most scandalous programs of the Bush administration, torture and secret surveillance of Americans decided to take shortcuts and to completely short circuit the law in a number of cases. So I would say the powers that be changed. I don't think any of us had some cataclysmic realization that suddenly the government was doing stuff wrong. The government suddenly started to do stuff terribly wrong. In my case, it's real simple. I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution. I did not take an oath to the President of the United States. I did not take an oath to secret surveillance. I didn't take an oath to my boss. I didn't take an oath to violating the law. It's that simple. And I had a constitutional responsibility as a senior executive at the National Security Agency to represent the law on behalf of the American people. So I'm proud, as I, given what I went through, I am proud of the fact that I spied on the secret surveillance state on behalf of the American public. And I make no apologies for that. I shared, I did share what I knew about the secret surveillance program without revealing secrets, and I shared what I knew about the massive fraud, waste, and abuse with a reporter exercising my First Amendment rights under the Constitution. Now these guys took a bet as they were leaving NSA that I would last three months. That's what I gave. I said you won't last more than three months with all this corruption here. It wasn't until I was forced to resign in April of 2008 that I finally left their surveillance regime and the secret state. What's giving, I have to say it again, what's giving is the Constitution. That is the governance mechanism, the very thing that James Madison imagined into existence in 1786 during that long winter in Virginia, staring, staring out west across the Blue Ridge Mountains. 
I could not stand, especially in October of 2001, when I was confronted by the reality that the government at the highest levels was in abject violation of the Constitution. I would not stand and watch that Constitution be subverted by my own government. And so I said, I'm going to fight them from within with everything I have. Number, number three. Hi, um, well, as a member of the American public who left mainly because of the bizarre world of 9-11, I'd really like to thank you for uh, defending some of the ideals I wasn't sure anyone still held in government. Um, I have two questions for you. Uh, the first is uh, mainly over the change of administrations. So during the Clinton administration and the change to the Bush administration, was the change in atmosphere in your agencies an immediate thing, or did it all occur mostly with Cheney's wet dream of 9-11? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, that, that's basically, I'm sorry, that's basically how I saw it, that basically there wasn't any change when Bush came on. I agree. I, I, people always say, you know, was there a big shift between working under Attorney General Janet Reno and John Ashcroft? And I didn't feel any, actually. It was 9-11 that created this cataclysmic shift for me and I think for the legal landscape in general for most attorneys in the country. Okay. Um, it's important to note that Vice President Cheney was given the national security plan. He was given the national security, the lead the national security establishment. That was his, his portfolio. That's why it was referred to as a Cheney blood oath. <laughs> so you have to understand very, very, very briefly, you have to understand that he had always <laughs> wanted, if he ever got into that kind of position, and he finally did as vice president, he wanted to restore the imperial presidency that had been lost under Richard Nixon. He had waited his time, he knew the system inside and out, and he had his people well placed. Okay. Sort of what I thought, unfortunately. I'm plus sorry you left. I hope you come back. We need more people well, but, like you. But plus by design, you see, they limited uh, congressional knowledge of it, and they didn't even tell the courts. So that's subverting the entire checks and balances process under the Constitution. And my second question actually leads to that. You mentioned okay. Nancy Pelosi being, um, shall we say, dragged into the secret. And uh, today- I think she went willingly. Okay, I, this is, I have no idea, but that's, yeah. I can imagine. Um, and today, uh, as, as Jessalyn manage, uh, mentioned, um, the FISA hearings are going on and Dianne Feinstein just <clears throat> yeah. unloaded an epic amount of fear mongering onto the Congress. Yes. Um, yeah. I guess around the time this all occurred, my, my family wondered, how was it that so many people that previously, I guess the perception was that they were very liberal, they would be very uh, defensive of rights, and they all fell like dominoes. Was this generally the sort of thing that happened at that time? Yeah, yeah because, because the intelligence community was giving them techno babble, saying that if we don't do all this collection, and by the way, they got rid of all the protections, there was no longer any encryption for privacy protection. They got rid of that after 9-11. And so they, they kept saying that, well, if we, don't, if we don't get all this data and collect it all, we won't be able to find the bad guys, which is absolutely false. There was no problem doing that from the beginning. And then you couple that with unapologetic fear mongering that yeah. went along to the mm -hmm. highest levels of our government. Um, and I think a lot of people after 9-11, everybody was scared. And I think during times of national security crises, Transhistorically, the United States has always shifted um, and been more repressive. We see that with the Alien and Sedition Acts. We see that with interning people of Japanese descent. We see this throughout history in response to a national security crisis. But usually it shifts back. I mean, we had Nixon, but then we had a lot of wonderful open press privacy protecting laws that came into being, which were promptly tossed out the window when 9-11 happened. And the government's been totally complicit. Even today, Dianne Feinstein basically said, you will have the blood on, you know, blood, blood on your hands 
to another representative for talking or even saying that there was a secret interp interpretation and that Americans <laughs> deserve to know that. And she was basically saying, you know, the next terrorist attack is right around the corner and we're not going to be equipped if we don't keep doing what we're doing in secret. I, I, I wanted to add one thing, though, about uh, the people in, in government and aid. There's an awful lot of good people at NSA. It's just they're all so introverted, okay? That, that's, that's a character. They're all, 85% are ISTJs in the Myers-Briggs. So they're all so introverted, you know, they're not, they're, not, uh, they're not the kind of people who would stand up and do things because, and they've looked at what they did to us, and they said, okay, if I stand up, I'm fired, I lose my job, I get blackballed, never get another job, or if I try to get one, they can get me fired from that, you know, like they did with Jessalyn. So, so there's a lot of fear, and that's what, that was the whole purpose of it, okay? to instill fear in the population of the government so they wouldn't whistleblow or expose all the crimes that they're committing. But the extroverts at NSA look at your shoes. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Two questions from the internet. Uh, you mentioned that we need more terrorists. However, if you scroll the hidden services, one gets the impression that it is used more by criminals than for freedom of speech. Do you think we should find a way to fight against this? Do we have to live with this? There are any number of lawful means by which you can determine criminal intent. Remember, technology is neutral. It can be used for bad and good. So, in the United States, although it apparently is something we no longer use, so if you want our Constitution, it's apparently out, out there for the bidding. I think the government's giving, a fr giving away free these days. Uh, no cost associated with it. Um, you have to have probable cause. And so you've got to make the case before a judge under, under the normal Constitution. I keep qualifying the Constitution when there's nothing to qualify. Because of enabling act laws, I'm using that phrase specifically, enabling act laws have been put in existence since 9-11. It's probable cause. So if you really feel that a criminal is using TOR for something that's not good, then go to the courts and make the case. But I would think twice and look at who's making the allegation that an amazing technology like Tor is being used by criminals because to me that sounds like a bunch of government bullshit that they've been throwing at lawful things that people have been doing in rebellion, in resistance to a surveillance state. I just gave you the devil's advocate argument for a surveillance state. Jesslyn gave you the counter. That's exactly what is happening. Everybody's suspicious. You use Tor, you're up to no good. You use encryption, you must be hiding something. If you're hiding something, we need to know about it to make sure that it's something that is good. Because if it's not, we're coming after you. But it must be bad because you're using encryption. Yeah, yeah but keep in mind also the intent was to be able to monitor what everybody's doing. So that means that gives them the ammunition to control what everybody does. If I have knowledge about you, I can cause you trouble like you can't get a loan or, you know, all kinds of things they can do to you and make, that, make, that, make life miserable for you. So that's their way of being able to control you. And it's like J. Edgar Hoover, that's how he controlled Congress. He had all the goods on everybody. So when, when you do that, that's, that's a setup for a totalitarian state. Okay, that's, that's the situation that I, that I used with uh, Jim Bamford saying that, that it's just a turnkey away from becoming a totalitarian state because they've set everything in place to make it happen. And this very country, not too long ago, had part of its country was in the form of a totalitarian fascist state. I don't want to live in a country like East Germany. I don't. History is actually on the side of freedom. History is actually on the side of liberty. Yeah. It really is. The wall did come down. Yeah. My, my point is that I'm going to stand up and object. I will not go quietly into the darkness. I'm going to stand up and object to everything they're doing.
As a lawyer for a number of these conscientious objectors, though, there is an extremely high price to pay. Yeah. Um, and for Tom faced the rest of his natural life in jail. Bradley Manning faces the rest of his natural life in jail. I believe the death penalty has been taken off the table. But, and I, I can't even speak to Julian Assange because he's been granted asylum, but is now holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. So there, I mean, the, the price is so heavy. That's not even to mention the, the price. I mean, the, I see whistleblowers who are routinely bankrupted, broken, blacklisted. Um, it's hard to put into human terms. I mean, just a regular, I mean, who here spent less than $100,000 on their legal fees? Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't quite spend quite that much. Okay, well, <laughs> it, I know <laughs> Tom ended up being defended on the criminal side by federal yeah. public defenders because he was deemed indigent. <clears throat> I had a legal defense fund. I had three attorneys. One luckily represented me pro bono, but we still spent upwards of $100,000 in attorney's fees. Mm -hmm. um, I know Bradley Manning has a defense fund. Julian Assange, I believe, has a similar mechanism set up, and I urge everybody to contribute <coughs> no matter how much, how little, anything helps. Um, th you can't put a price on freedom. Yeah. Yeah, the, the one person that we, ha we haven't mentioned here is the uh, one of the, uh, Kirk Weeby and I and, and John Kiriakou got the Callaway Awards for, for civic courage. And uh, they forced John to, to plea bargain for a 30-month sentence because he exposed the torture at, at, at CIA. Um, and they did that, they had the leverage they had against him was he had five young kids, okay? That meant if he went to jail, for, they were threatening 30, 40 years, I don't know, a long time, he would never see his kids grow up. So that, that leverage they used against him to get him to plea bargain. Now I, I, I look at that as a national disgrace. Here we are sending the guy who exposed torture to jail and letting the torturers and the people who ordered torture scot-free. That is a national disgrace. And after all was said and done in violation of the Constitution, I'm the only one that was prosecuted and indicted facing the rest of my life in jail for having exposed and disclosed the Stellar Wind program the secret surveillance program of the national security state. What does that tell you? When you begin to criminalize Americans who are actually standing up and honoring the oath they swore to uphold, we have a problem, Houston. Two more questions from the internet. Would you consider the US government or part of it as an enemy of the constitution? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> the, cons the Constitution directly threatens the ability of the surveillance state to exist. This is, by the way, this is the reason I signed an affidavit saying what they're doing to, and submitted it for the EFF lawsuit, uh, Jewel versus NSA. I was attempting to get into court to testify so that they couldn't claim deni you know, plausible deniability anywhere. And, and then get the courts to rule on all this illegal, unconstitutional surveillance. And that's why we're speaking to you and yep. are speaking at events around the world, no matter how big or how small, because all of us, after what we went through, believe that no American and no individual on the entire planet, for that matter, should have to go through right. something similar. And imagine what else, especially at this Congress, with the people we see in the audience and beyond, in doing all you can with all the skills you have to defend liberty and freedom around the world. It gives voice, it gives people the ability to communicate. And the better they can do so without the surveillance state knowing about it, then the more that liberty and freedom can thrive and push back against those who apparently have taken their own oath 
to take away liberty and take away freedom from others. That's not who we are as human beings. No one has the right to take away who you are from yourself. Maintain your integrity and character. Number two. Yes. Um, all three of you decided to blow the whistle with your name and surname and decided to do this publicly. But this has caused you a lot of, tro of problems, as, as you have described. Um, what, 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 what I'm asking myself is, if a system that allowed you to speak up anonymously, would you have chosen such a system over what you decided to do in the end? And if so, do you think the impact of speaking up would have been limited? Yes. Actually, I felt it was important to have my name on what I was saying because that adds credibility to the statement. I'm not hiding, I'm facing the government right up, okay? If I were an anonymous government, ex-government employee, you know, that wouldn't have the weight, it wouldn't carry any weight anywhere. But I put my name on everything that I was saying so that they, so the government knew that I was saying it and they could take me into court and charge me with the, with the felonies of exposing the crimes they were committing which in turn would say they're actively admitting the crimes that they're doing. <laughs> so I thought that was a worthwhile way of doing it. So I was, ready, I was ready to go to court any way I could. But in contrast to what Bill just said, which is admirable, I blew the whistle anonymously. I mean, for me, for me anonymity meant it was not about fame. It was not about profit. It was not about my own self-aggrandizement. And a lot of whistleblower laws are set up so you can blow the whistle in an anonymously so you're protected. Tom went to the inspector general, which promised anonymity and to protect whistleblowers. Unfortunately, the inspector general sold Tom and Bill and three other people whose names are have been mentioned tonight, Diane Rourke and Kirk Wiebe and Ed Loomis, all of whom I've had the privilege of representing, sold them down the river when it was supposed to, I mean, it double-crossed the whistleblower, basically. But anonymity gives you a layer of protection. Um, so I, I don't think anonymity is necessarily always bad. It's great if you can put your name to something, but when the risks are so high, I do understand why the truth teller may want a certain degree of anonymity once you've had your life ripped open. And it's very hard to convey that to you, what it feels like to be confronted with your, your own records. Imagine being confronted with all of your internet searches, with all of the websites that you've clicked on. Yeah. I mean, if someone just took a typical Google search of what I look at every day, you know, a typical day, I'm Googling torture, I'm Googling Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda, and, you know, why do men have nipples? And, you know, I look like a terrorist and a total perv. <laughs> <laughs> In reality, I'm a human rights attorney who happens to have two teenage boys who ask me a question that I'm trying to find the answer to. Um, well, that's the danger of having data taken out of context. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you see, but for my part, I felt that the technical stuff I was going to be talking about and exposing required credibility behind it. That is, otherwise nobody would believe it. I mean, the mainstream media doesn't publish anything on this at all over our, our country. I don't know about over here, you know. It is true in my case, to answer your question directly, if I had gone public, some people have asked me this, why didn't you go public in October of 2001 when you knew in that first week that the White House, the government, was in violation of the Constitution? I knew that if I had gone public, I would have been immediately fired. There's no question. And so I chose to go through all the legal means that were available to me within the system for justice, 
Now, I did reach a point early 2006 because of all other paths having been exhausted, I chose to go to a reporter with what I knew. And is it, it is true that that became a triggering event for the government to come after me, but that was just a triggering event. The communication that I have with the reporter, which I've never discussed in detail, use many of the technologies that many of you here in this very room and beyond are quite familiar with. Let's just say this. I have no evidence, or well, I can't actually prove it because everything was taken from my house. I have no evidence the government ever broke into my systems, given what I knew and what was available to me to protect myself and have reasonable expectation I can remain reasonably anonymous on the internet. Well, but it's not, it's not an absolute secure world, even when you're anonymous. Yeah. And part of the reason they came to my house was to simply take the equipment, period. Okay, number I, on, I, on the other hand, wanted, I wanted to add one other thing. Just, I, I, on the other hand, tell them exactly what I think of them in open, unencrypted, unencrypted emails, so that when they take them in and read them, they know what I think of them. I refer to them, Fort, I, re, I refer to NSA as Fort Fumble, Fort Run Amok, you know? The FBI is the MIB, or the Gestapo, or the White House brown shirts. You know, these are the terms I use. <laughs> so. so there's a paradox here. Remember, my case, although I had defense attorneys representing me criminally you know, in, the in the court, I knew that I could not defend myself completely without being defended in the court of public opinion. And so going public, even during the pendency of my trial, was crucial to my ultimate defense and my ultimate freedom. So there is something to be said, and even being immunized when you go public. Number two. Hi, uh, hey guys. Um, thanks for coming to Germany and uh, talking to the CCC. I'm glad you guys would come here. And uh, I guess I have two questions, which I already know the answers to because we've talked about it before. Um, but I was hoping you could tell some people here. So the first question is, um, can you describe what the term cast iron means? So for example, if someone here is a hacker were targeted, what does it mean to be part of the cast iron club? That's my first question. Can, can I answer that one first? Yeah. Uh, it, it, it simply means that all of your attributes are loaded into all the nearest devices for deep packet inspection, for pulling all your data, phone calls, everything, and routing it to certain places, either getting it recorded or passed off. And so everything you do that can be recognized by the nearest device automatically forward. Cool. And then the second question is, what is the direction that we should take for cryptography? And in particular, is there any way that you can describe without getting into more trouble uh, the difference between Suite A and Suite B crypto so that we can try to build better crypto systems to try to resist this kind of totalitarianism? You see, okay, I, as I, don't, I don't really know those things, okay? I never worked on anything that was public in the United States. I only worked on foreign systems. So if, if, we're, if you were talking about that, I could address that. Are there but, any but not, crypto not systems we shouldn't design like, for example? <laughs> no, I, I always like, to, I assume that they all have the keys and everything. If they don't, they can get them. So if they want to target you and get and break you and read your stuff, they can do that. I assume that, okay. So that's why I was advocating a binary level transposition fa or swap factors that would, you know, destroy the integrity of anything you were going to encrypt and then you do your encryption and pass it on and then do a reverse uh, bit swap at the other end. You know, if you do it on a 500, uh, a 64 character 512 bit package, you get 512 factorial bit pattern swap patterns there. So that's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of extra complexity to the system that makes more work for them. It, when building, I guess, when, when trying to build crypto systems to resist this, I guess the question that comes to my mind is, is, is it the case that if we can avoid identification, that is, if we are anonymizing our things, that it becomes simply almost an intractable problem to be able to target us, but once we're targeted, <coughs> we're just fucked? I mean, just to be straight up about it. I like, I'm fucked, but maybe there's somebody here in the audience that's not. <laughs> well, if you're not targeted, yeah, you're all right. <laughs> 
And what happens when, I mean, I mean, do you think it's possible to resist being targeted? Or are there things we should do to, re I, you, I'm screwed, but this is a hypothetical person that's not. No, but see, that the level of incompetence that's involved here can put people, in, absolutely innocent people, on the target list. I you, would, can get, you can get rendered just by having something close to a, a name of somebody who's a real target. There's that's enough, happened. And there's enough attribute information on you. If they really want to go after you, they're going to go after you anyways. Yeah. And that's, this, this is really the paradox of Internet. I wouldn't trust any encryption system out there that has a government stamp on it. Yeah. And I would be very cautious <laughs> about any available encryption system that currently exists. Yeah. I've laid down a challenge in private to several of you who are w very well placed. I will not name names. But what we need, it's crucial for the future freedom of internet starting today. When you have devices like Naris using deep packet inspection and other techniques, and when you have access to practically all information, especially envelope information, it makes it very easy to target anybody at any time. I'd like to say, as a non-techie though, I think things like Tor are a hell of a good start. And I know this morning you talked about, you know, not just tearing down the barn, but, you know, giving credit where credit is due, and that is definitely on the right path. Now, I'm still working through the Tor for Dummies manual um, myself, but to me, that seems like a good idea. I mean, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't use, say there's so nothing on the out other there hand, On all. the other hand, Jake, I always like to take the opportunity to tell them what I think of them. So if I used, if I used to secure a crypt system, they wouldn't be able to read it. I want them to read it. I mean, so I, I think that works really well for you guys, but there are a bunch of people here that will just get a fucking drone strike, right? Like mm -hmm. our white yeah. privilege and American passport yeah. keeps us from getting a drone strike, but that's not going to uh, protect Julian. That's not necessarily true. Yeah, well, not for long, but I'm just saying right now, I don't hear the drone, <laughs> Yeah. right? I mean, maybe when I go outside, but I think that there are people here that don't have that privilege. Yeah. And in fact, a lot of those people in Pakistan have already been killed. Yeah, and so right. I guess the thing is that I really want to find a way that we can resist this where the people who are under threat right now you know, there must be things that you think that they should do, and that would be great to hear because there are people all over the world watching this now, and, and those people maybe have those risks, and we should try to figure that out. And if Tor is part of it, great, and if Tor is not, that's also great. I'd like to know, and I think other people would too, and, and thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I always favored codes over ciphers because you can make up, you know, the codes, and, and it would take people to figure out what the code meant. So that's, that's a resource that they don't have a lot of, okay, people. So I, I was a favorite of code, but I like to tell them openly, since I'm in a special place, I guess, I like to tell them exactly what I think of them, because I know all these people, you know. I just, they're all, I referred to them in Princeton as I was giving a little talk up there as slime balls. All of them are slime balls, and that's a mild term, okay. I don't know the other technical terms like bullshit, I don't know that, but. I think at the same time, you can see the power of technology. Yeah. I mean, when you see a country shut down the internet for all yeah. of its people, you realize the transformational power that technology has and what role it can play in an entire democratic revolution. So um, it, not everyone has the luxury of having a computer. N not even close to it, but you can yell and scream in the streets and you can communicate with those of us who do have a computer. Um. Okay, time is up. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.